Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very sensitive. It's so, so, so very heartbreaking and I've seen people online talking about it in all kinds of different ways, having so many different opinions about what exactly is going on and just how responsible this young mother is for her own actions. I do want to stay as objective as possible when I'm discussing this case, but as you all know, and I'm sure all of you can relate, that when a case does involve children, it's just that much more tragic. It's a lot harder to talk about, in my opinion, and it's very, very difficult to listen to. But nonetheless, I wanted to bring this case to you guys because there are things that we can learn and begin to understand what somebody in Lindsay's position might be going through. 32-year-old Lindsay Clancy is married to her 34-year-old husband, Patrick. Before that, Lindsay got her bachelor's degree in biology from Quinnipiac University in Hampton, Connecticut in 2014. Then she went to Massachusetts General Hospital Institute of Health Professions, where she earned her degree in nursing in 2016. She was either certified or licensed in the neonatal resuscitation program, pediatric advanced life support, and advanced cardiac life support. According to a post from an individual claiming to be a patient who worked with Lindsay, quote, Lindsay was my nurse when I delivered my third baby. It was her first night shift back to work after having her first baby. She was so sweet and happy talking about her new baby girl. She was an excellent nurse, smart and attentive. She advocated for me and my baby. She kept us safe and well cared for. Patrick described that when the two of them met, it was love at first sight. The two had met through Patrick's cousin and sister, and they were engaged by December 31st, 2015. Her and Patrick went on to get married in 2016. Then they purchased their first home together for $500,000 in Duxbury, Massachusetts in 2018. Lindsay drove an SUV, which had a baby on board sticker on the back. In their backyard, the family had a white picket fence, a swing set, a green slide, a soccer ball, and a toy wheelbarrow. Everything you would expect in a yard that belonged to a family with young children. Patrick said that the marriage between the two of them was really great. He took such pride in being Lindsay's husband. They never let each other forget how much they loved one another, making sure to let each other know every single day and showing physical affection towards each other by giving each other the biggest hug each morning. The couple then went on to have three children, five-year-old Cora, three-year-old Dawson, and eight-month-old Callan. Patrick went on to describe each of their three children and I will read directly from his words. Cora had an infectious laugh and was stunningly beautiful. She was the cautious one, but it really was because she was so caring. She used to say she wanted to be a doctor and a mama when she grew up and she would practice by giving Callan checkups. If she was leaving the house to go somewhere, she would pick someone to take care of Caroline and Charlotte, her baby dolls. She had all the doll accessories available so her sitters were well equipped. Before she turned two, she was already wrapping them in perfect swaddles. We would tell her she's such a good little mama. She loved all babies, both real and pretend. She loved sloths, unicorns, tea parties, going to lunch with Nana and Grandpa, and giving presents to people. She knew everything about princesses, her favorite being Sophia the First. She truly loved her brothers and us and said it often in her sweet voice. Dawson had beautiful, bold, brown eyes that beamed with friendship. He was naturally humorous and generous beyond the norm of a typical toddler, always wanting to share his toys with others. For all the love he received, he always gave back Back more. His best quality was his pure kindness. He loved trucks, tractors, dinosaurs, Paw Patrol, worker guys, and being outside. He was adventurous and mischievous and enjoyed causing trouble, which he typically found hilarious. He was also remarkably smart. We often said if we didn't save enough for retirement, it'll be okay. We would just live in Dawson's guest house. He would hug me tighter than most adults and every night he told me inconsistent words at bedtime without fail. Good night, Dada. I love you. Callan was our easygoing child. I always said it was because he was the third child. He had to adapt and he did easily. He was born with hardly any fuss and was was by far our best sleeper. He was just an incredibly happy and vibrant baby, constantly smiling. Our nickname for him was Happy Callan. He was sitting on his own and you could tell he was enjoying his growing independence as he would grab any object within reach. 
Sometimes he joined my Microsoft calls in the background playing in his jumpy. I would often keep my camera on, too proud to leave it off. He started saying Dada whenever I walked into the room. The last moment we ever had together was our routine. I would come up from my office at the end of the day and swing him between my legs while he laughed and smiled. If I was ever having a bad day, Callan always knew how to heal me. On Facebook, the way Lindsay felt about her children showed much of the same. Almost every photo of hers was a photo of one or more of her children. She often posted pictures with her husband, her children, often talking about just how thankful she is for her family and her life. The children's aunts and grandparents all said that the family had a beautiful life. The children were well cared for. However, Lindsay was also open about her struggles with postpartum anxiety and depression, which is something that a lot of young mothers go through after having children. According to the National Library of Medicine, about 6.5 to 20% of all women can develop postpartum depression. Now, the author of this article goes on to describe that during pregnancy, a woman goes through tremendous changes, including hormonal, physical, emotional, and psychological changes all throughout pregnancy. Then, the process of giving birth itself is an exhausting emotional experience. I personally don't have any children, but I work with children, and with that, I work with many, many mothers and fathers ranging from late teens and early 20s to late 30s or early 40s when they have given birth. Just hearing about some of the things that these women go through and their deliveries and everything that can go wrong and everything that changes after having that baby... I can imagine how stressful, how exhausting, and how much of a change that can be. Women are the absolute strongest creatures because of this, and you can argue in the comments, but I said what I said. The author of this article goes on to explain that most women will experience something called baby blues, where they experience a wide range of emotions, like extreme joy and pleasure, two bouts of sadness and crying but these feelings will typically decrease after about two weeks. The National Library of Medicine writes, quote, the rapid changes in reproductive hormones like estradiol and progesterone following the delivery can be a potential stressor in susceptible women, and these changes can lead to the onset of depressive symptoms. But if their depressive symptoms and sadness and mood swings last after those two weeks, it can present as postpartum depression. Typically, postpartum depression starts about six weeks after childbirth. Postpartum depression can deeply affect the relationship between the mother and the infant and can affect the mother's normal return to function and normal life. Symptoms of PPD can include feelings of guilt or hopelessness, agitation, insomnia or hypersomnia, loss of interest or pleasure throughout most days, loss of energy or feelings of fatigue, change in weight or appetite, impaired cognition or indecisiveness, or suicidal ideation and or reoccurring thoughts of death. In some cases, women also feel heightened anxiety as well as symptoms of psychosis, including delusions and hallucinations, which can be something like voices telling the mother to harm the infant, and this is coming directly from the National Library of Medicine. PPD can lead to poor maternal infant bonds or failure for breastfeeding, negative parenting practices, marital problems, as well as outcomes that can negatively affect the child's physical and psychological development and well-being. As many as half of new mothers go undiagnosed due to privacy and stigma. They fear that disclosing these feelings can lead to abandonment and fear of lack of support and judgment. There is a lot of guilt around feeling like you aren't the best mother or parent that you can be, and I see others judging parents all of the time, including other health professionals. So I can see how mothers just get these horrible feelings of guilt and never feeling like they're good enough. According to another article in the National Library of Medicine, there is a strong relationship between postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression. About 25-50% to 50 of women with some sort of anxiety disorder show symptoms of PPD about two months after childbirth. 
Two in three women suffering from depression during the first seven months postpartum will have a comorbid anxiety disorder. So, I'm telling you all of these stats about PPD, obviously, because it relates to this case in the sense that Lindsay was known to suffer from postpartum anxiety, which is closely linked to PPD, which again, we know that Lindsay had been struggling with. It seemed that Lindsay tried her best to be the best mother she possibly could. She tried her best to love her children and provide for them, and it seems that she was trying to take care of herself at the same time so that she could be a better version of herself for her children. By July of 2022, she posted to Facebook six weeks after giving birth to her third child, Callan, that she was feeling dialed in. She was starting to focus on exercise, nutrition, and her mindset and she said that this has made all the difference. At the time, Lindsay was on leave from her job at the Massachusetts General Hospital. At the same time, Lindsay had actually been undergoing an extensive five-day-per-week treatment program for PPD, trying to get control of her situation. So it seemed that whatever she was facing, it was pretty serious. Because of this, Patrick decided to work from home instead of going into work so that he was able to support Lindsay on a daily basis and take care of their children while she attended her five-day-a-week program. However, everything in their lives changed on January 24th, 2023. On the evening of this day, Patrick left the house, leaving his three children and Lindsay home alone while he was gone for about 25 minutes to pick up some takeout food for dinner. However, upon returning home at around 6 p.m., Patrick found his wife, Lindsay, laying unconscious on the ground outside of their home. When police arrived to the scene, they found Lindsay lying on the ground outside. When they went inside, they found three children laying unconscious with obvious signs of trauma. A neighbor reported that he had also gotten a call from his son, who reported seeing a woman laying on the ground. This neighbor rushed over to see what was going on, and he also found EMTs attempting CPR on an infant outside on the ground. Of course, these three children were five-year-old Cora, three-year-old Dawson, and eight-month-old Callan. Each of them were loaded into four ambulances and taken to the hospital. From the start, authorities said that it appeared that these three children had each been strangled, and then Lindsay attempted to take her own life by jumping off of the top floor of the house, which was reportedly over a 20-foot fall. On the report, it was said that Lindsay sustained back injuries and neck lacerations from the fall. And unfortunately, heartbreakingly, soul-crushingly, five-year-old Cora and three-year-old Dawson were pronounced dead by the time they arrived to the hospital. At the same time, little Callan was still alive. Barely, but he was hanging on so he was airlifted to Boston for treatment there. He was on life support for three days, but by Friday, January 27th at 11.18 a.m., the baby was pronounced dead at the Children's Hospital in Boston. As for Lindsay, she is still alive and she is still at Boston Hospital recovering. However, she has been placed under arrest and was charged initially with two counts of murder, three counts of strangulation or suffocation, and three counts of assault and battery with a deadly weapon. As of right now, she is expected to be charged with an additional count of murder after she is released from the hospital. Now, as of right now, I haven't been able to read the affidavit or details in the case leading to these charges. We don't know all of the details of the children's injuries, but it must have been pretty horrible based on the charges that we do see. But officials in this case say that while this is a horrible, tragic, horrific scene, obviously they don't want speculation. They don't want people going out there and making assumptions about different things, but in terms of what exactly happened, I think it is pretty clear who is responsible, but we don't know what led to it. We know that she was only left alone for 25 minutes before the unthinkable happened. I can't believe or even imagine what could have happened to make it so that within this very, very short period of time, something snapped and she took it out on her children. 
clearly, Lindsay is, was, and will continue to struggle very severely. She clearly has severe mental issues. We know that. But like I said at the beginning of the video, lots of people have their own opinions on this case, as you can imagine and expect. I, for one, am angry. I'm confused. I'm sad and I'm heartbroken, and my stomach is in absolute knots. I can't even imagine how horrific this is for the children's family. Their aunts and uncles have all come out to express their grief and shock. No one, even Patrick, was expecting this level of violence and this situation to happen. Nobody expected this to escalate the way that it has. As of January 28th, Patrick has released a statement about this tragedy, saying that he forgives his wife. He wrote, quote, Thank you all for the love and support. This warmth I've received from the community is palpable, and your generosity gives me hope that I can focus on some sort of healing. I've seen all of your messages and contributions, including some from people I haven't even seen in over a decade and many I've never met. I see and appreciate every one of you. A lot of people have said that they can't imagine, and they're right. There's absolutely nothing that can prepare you. The shock and pain is excruciating and relentless. I'm constantly reminded of them, and with the little sleep I get, I dream about them on repeat. Any parent knows it's impossible to understand how much you will love your kids until you have them. The same goes for understanding the devastation of losing them. Cora, Dawson, and Callan were the essence of my life, and I'm completely lost without them. My family was the best thing that ever happened to me. I took so much pride in being Lindsay's husband and a dad to Cora, Dawson, and Callan. I always reminded myself that each day with them was a new gift. Callan usually woke up first and would rest his head on my shoulder for a few minutes as he adjusted to the morning. Dawson typically sang or spoke his thoughts out loud for a while before we'd go get him. Cora was a big girl and would simply walk downstairs. I can still vividly picture her coming into the living room each morning with her hair in a mess, a smile on her face. We always started our days together, reading books, cuddling up on the couch, and playing with magnet tiles. I loved taking them places, whether it was scooting at Chandler Elementary, vacation, skiing, out on the boat, or Duxbury Beach, one of our favorite places on earth. They gave me a purpose, and I never took it for granted. There is now a massive void where that purpose once was. Then he goes on to describe each one of his children, which I did read to you all earlier. He goes on to say, quote, I want to share some thoughts about Lindsay. She's recently been portrayed largely by people who have never met her and never knew who the real Lindsay was. Our marriage was wonderful and diametrically grew stronger as her condition rapidly worsened. I took as much pride in being her husband as I did in being a father and I felt persistently lucky to have her in my life. I still remember the moment I first laid eyes on her, and I can recall how overcome I was with the kind of love at first sight that you only see in movies. I really didn't take long before I was certain I wanted to marry her. We said I love you to each other multiple times a day, as if it were a reflex. We habitually started every morning with a passionate hug, yielding a sigh of relief like we each had received the perfect medicine. If too much time had passed without a hug, she'd look at me and say, did you forget? We mutually understood the reality that people can have bad days, but we stuck to the rule that when one of us got lost, the other was always there to bring them home, always. She loved being a nurse, but nothing matched her intense love for our kids and dedication to being a mother. It was all she ever wanted. Her passion taught me how to be a better father. I want to ask all of you that you find it deep within yourselves to forgive Lindsay, as I have. The real Lindsay was generously loving and caring towards everyone, me, our kids, family, friends, and her patients. The very fibers of her soul are loving. All I wish for her now is that she can somehow find peace. I promise I'll put all my energy into healing and rediscovering my purpose. I owe that to all of you, Duxbury Fire and Police, our compassionate healthcare workers, our local faith leaders, the Microsoft community, and especially Cora, Dawson, and Callan. I don't know how or when I'll be able to do it, but your love and generosity will help me get started. I know that love always wins. Cora, Dawson, and Callan, you gave me so much in your short time here. I don't know if the pain will ever go away, but I'll do my best to carry on in your honor. Dada loves you so much and will always remember you. 
with endless love and gratitude. With that, I don't want to talk about how I would react. I'm not judging Patrick or anybody else in their family. It's their tragedy, and obviously we would all react differently to this type of situation. I don't want to see negative comments about Patrick or how their family has responded to this. None of us, unless you have gone through the same exact situation, can even imagine what Patrick is going through. He is suffering and he's clearly just trying to make sense of all of this. Him and his family have a whole lot of healing to do. Everyone involved in this case is going to have to find ways to heal. Even those who are among the first responders in this case have said that they have had to receive trauma counseling. Many of them, if not all of them, have said that this situation was the worst thing that they have ever dealt with in their careers which is absolutely understandable and I couldn't agree more. This stuff is just unimaginable and unthinkable and I know that I keep saying that, but I'm so sick of seeing children be murdered, children being ripped away from their families. People need support. People need help. To anybody who knows a new mother or father, or even if they're not new but they just gave birth recently, please just offer your support to your loved one. Offer to babysit offer to help clean up the house, offer to spend time with your loved one and let them know you care about them. Let them know that they have your support. Again, I don't have children of my own, but I have people very close to me who have experienced mental health issues such as PPD and postpartum anxiety. Even if you don't suffer from a mental illness, parenthood can be isolating. It can be exhausting and there are days that nothing seems worth it nothing seems right and nothing seems that it will ever get better. And sometimes all these parents need is a break, support, something to help them see the light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a reason with all of this. So I will just leave you with a message to support your loved ones. That's all I ask of you. The family has set up a GoFundMe account to help support Patrick as he navigates through this tragedy. The page writes, quote, this GoFundMe is intended to help Pat pay for medical bills, funeral services, and legal help. This assistance is essentially needed because Pat will be unable to work for the foreseeable future as he weathers this painful, life-altering tragedy. We all know Pat to be the most kind and genuine person. As someone who is willing to support others, we sincerely thank you for offering yours. As of right now, they have raised $800,000, which is absolutely amazing. But if you do have anything to spare, please think of donating. Anything helps, and I'm sure Patrick will be needing this money for years and years to come to pay for all of these different expenses while he isn't able to work. So please, if you do have anything, think about donating. But that is where I will end today's case. I wanted to cover this case mostly with hopes of obviously bringing this case to light but also to raise awareness on the issue of PPD and anxiety. I know I got on my soapbox about supporting your loved ones, but please understand that if you know someone going through PPD or something similar, this case highlights just how tough that truly is. They're not faking it, they're not doing it because they're a bad parent, they're not doing it because they don't love their children. They have a mental illness that takes time, patience, and a lot of help to get better. I'm not saying that Lindsay is not responsible for her actions. I think that what she did is truly, truly, truly horrendous and horrific and just unimaginable. But I really hope that she gets the help that she desperately needs while also serving time for what she did. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. I will be leaving some resources down below, including the suicide hotline, child abuse resources, and anything else that I can find that I think will be helpful. So make sure you check those out down below if you do happen to know anybody who needs help. But either way, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.